Hello and welcome everyone to another UFOB interview. Today I'm really excited to introduce to you Matt Hurley. His website is badaliens.info. Matt resides in the South, South Wales in the UK. He's been interested in UFOs since he's, he was a child. He attended his first UFO conference in the early 1990s. In the late 90s, he became interested in the depiction of UFOs in ancient art and literature and had a website compiling many images he had come across, um, such as the Battle of Nuremberg. He had a book published in 2003 on this topic forwarded by Whitley Strieber. And the topic was, or the book was, I'm sorry, is The Alien Chronicles. Around this time, he gave several presentations on his research, including the International UFO Congress in Nevada, February 20, 2004. And soon after, he hit a wall with the subject and dropped out of ufology. And then in 2018, several TTSA articles in the national press caught his eye, and he was pulled back into the subject. And his focus this time around was what he perceived as the alien agenda, which included the writings of Marshall Vian Summers. He created his site, badaliens.info, in May of 2021, which shows what he thinks aliens are up to, and a conclusion referencing Marshall Vian Summers, who explains why they are doing it. And we'll ask him, what is it? So without any further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, Matt Hurley, along with Enforcine, who you will find on our Discord. And so here is not and for scene, almost said his name. <laughs> and Matt Hurley. Hey Matt, how you doing today? I'm good, thank you. And good I did back. also want to say we may have a few other panelists popping in um, later, but uh, for now it's uh, myself and and unforeseen. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for coming on. This subject is uh, very touchy, and um, I will say right off the bat for everyone, this is not safe for work. And on some of these uh, pictures, they're not safe for really anything. So. <laughs> So be ready. But um, uh, again, Matt, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so let's go back to 2018. I'm pulled back into the subject. And I want to know what is the $64,000 question? What are the aliens doing here? And why are they doing it? So my approach was to make a list of all the phenomenon that I've noticed that are associated with the subject. So that would include abductions, animal mutilations, sometimes known as cattle mutilations, but there are other animals as well as cattle, human mutilations, which are the elephant in the room. Not many researchers talk about them. Missing people, as highlighted by researcher David Polides. And there are also some attacks by UFOs, as evidenced in Calares in Brazil in 1977. So once I, I put my list together, I had a bit of a picture of what's going on and it seemed to lean towards a sinister, dark agenda. I made a list of phenomenon that associated with the subject and it leaned towards it not being benign, more nefarious. Now we don't want to come across as a doom monger or a threat narrative junkie. I'm just trying to honestly look at the phenomenon as I see it. And if people ask me about the subject, I'll try and be honest with them. So if we take the first subject heading on my website, um, which is called badaliens.info that you mentioned earlier, um, we can have a look through the contents there. Can you bring the slide up? Yeah. Okay, so I've got an introduction there on what abductions are, which we're all pretty much familiar with. I think the important thing I find with abductions is the evidence of implants. And I've highlighted the work of Dr. Roger Lear um, who performed about 17 operations removing alleged alien implants from abductees. And he highlighted a series of characteristics that he'd noted with implants. And some of the things that stood out for me was the fact that every implant he removed was a different, was a different size and shape. And they're also of different compositions as well. One had, I think, about 36 um, elements within it. Another sample had about 11. And also as well, there's no point of entry on the victim. The implant is within the person's body, but there's no scarring. Um, so I've also included a link to a lecture that Roger gave before he died in 2014. One thing that concerns me is that no one seems to have taken over the baton from Dr. Roger Lair because he was doing the implant removals. He died in 2014. Who's now doing them? I think there was such a tangible, compelling bit of evidence, these implants. 
I'm not, not aware of anyone since that's carried taken over the baton from him. Oh, that's a really Would good. Have ever studied in depth these implants, like put to rigorous scientific? Uh, yeah, that yeah. On, on my website, I, I list um, a lot of the scientific studies that were done on them and what their conclusions were, what they were, what they were composed of. Um, one had thirty six elements. One was a, had about eleven or twelve. So the the odd thing is, they're all different shapes and sizes. So it could be they're bespoke to the individual. Um, I'd imagine I'm speculating now. They're probably multifaceted. Um, you know, an iPhone doesn't just make phone calls; it can do lots of things. So I'd imagine these implants probably track, probably influence. You know, take readings from the bodies. Probably lots of different functions they can do. Uh, I think they noticed there was evidence of carbon nanotechnology within these objects, yes. um, mm -hmm. and there was no um, a reaction to the body of a foreign object as well once they were inserted. Um, so there were a lot of anomalies associated with them. Um, I've got a link there to an implant that someone's got under their arm. And I've mentioned some of the key researchers there, Carla Turner, who's no longer with us, and Dr. David Jacobs. Both of these researchers um, came to the conclusion after many interviews with abductees that a hybrid program was underway where they were taking um, reproductive material from males and females and created a hybrid species. I'll be talking more about that in the conclusion. You can see there as well, there's there's often scoop marks that are found on individuals as well. It's something um, Bud Hopkins really highlighted quite a bit yeah. in, in all of his conferences. People talk about sleep paralysis and that sort of thing, but you know there are some physical traces mm -hmm. that are left behind. Triangular, triangular marks are quite a popular. I'd, I'd like to say that um, Adam, who was going to be, who was going to be here, he still may um, be here at some time, but he woke up with um, the triangular marks. These, these mm -hmm. right here. He showed us a picture. Mm -hmm. it, it. Yeah, I mean, going back to the alien agenda, mm -hmm. uh, it's what I've noticed with a lot of ufologists is um, they're so obsessed with disclosure, they're not spending any time um, speculating on what the agenda of the visitors may be. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important thing to do, which is what compelled me to make my website. It's a question that not enough people are asking. Um, other people. If you ask them, they might say, well, the majority of the aliens are good. There's, there's a few that are bad. But what are you basing those statistics on? I think a lot of ufology is based on hope mm -hmm. and wishful thinking rather than looking at the data. What is the data telling you? The data telling me on my website is that this phenomenon isn't benign. And I think deep within the bowels of some of the governments in the world, they, they're aware of this, and it's partly why the cover-up remains. Yeah, well, that certainly seems so when uh, it comes to the um, day after Roswell by 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 Colonel Corso. Um, he, I actually, if you don't mind, I'll um, I'll just say, oops, I'll just say a few words that he had from. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. I'll just say a few words that he had from his book when it comes to what they know. Um, one of the things Corso said towards the end of the book, he said, um, I didn't know it yet, but a sequence of events was unfolding that would swirl me into one of the biggest controversies of my life, just as the chilling truth about the attempts to colonize our planet and the harvesting of human beings and animals that were still going on made itself all too clear. And then later on, he says, um, we both knew who the real targets of the SDI were because he was um, talking about Reagan's um, space defense initiative. And it wasn't a bunch of ICBM warheads. It was the UFOs, alien spacecraft thinking themselves invulnerable and invisible as they soared around the edges of our atmosphere, swooping down at will to destroy our communications with EMP bursts, buzz our spacecraft, colonize our lunar surface, mutilate cattle in their own horrendous biological experiments, and even abduct human beings for their medical tests and hybridization of the species. And what was worse, we had to let them do it because we had no weapon to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last thing he says is when the, that truth of alien intervention in our planet's affairs and our ongoing contact with an alien culture is finally revealed, it won't be frightening, even though it will be a shock. I kind of think it'll still be frightening for some. <laughs> yeah, there's some, yeah, some ambitious thinking there, but yeah, he's on the yeah. right line, certainly. Right. Go, go, going back to the wishful thinking aspect, um, yeah. you've got the phenomenon of C5, where people gather together, they send out positive thoughts in yeah. the hope of, of craft appearing, which sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. But again, it's based on hope. You don't really know what's on board. You don't know what the agenda is of those occupants. Mm -hmm. That craft could have abducted someone the night before and performed 
to grade and experiments on them. Yes. So I, I always urge caution with things like C5. There's an awful lot of wishful thinking within the subject. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll definitely say that um, I'm guilty of uh, feeling the same way when I first got into this around five or six years mm -hmm. ago, thinking, oh, they're all good, they're all good, but not ever well obviously i started moving into oh cattle mutilation why would they do that and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> then it, it, it just rolls on and then you kind of start thinking okay there's there's the good and the bad guys here they can't all be good there's, there's a big dichotomy between what a lot of experience say um from their et experiences and what's actually going on in the field you mm -hmm. have this strong new age flavor with a lot of channelers and contactees the beans talk about ascension how we're going to raise your frequency, we're going to land soon and everything's going to be fine, we're going to sort things out. And in the meantime, you've got some guy in a line in a field in Brazil with no eyes, no lips and no tongue. And, and to me, there's a big disconnect between what these people are allegedly meeting aliens are saying and what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to highlight that on my website. Yeah, it needs to be said and people need to, to gain awareness of this. It's, it's an important part of ufology. It's huge. I, th I think it reflects human nature that when it comes to contact, people will automatically assume that the beings are going to be nice and benign. But I think the evidence shows the contrary. I think humans, when it comes to contact, fear meeting an aspect of themselves, something controlling, something deceptive, something greedy. They're looking for a utopia. And I think the aliens are aware of that, and that's why their messages follow that line. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, I'd say... That I want to talk about the hippies back in the 60s and 70s. I mean, that must have been perfect for them, for the mm -hmm. malevolent aliens, I'll say, in that um, they were saying, oh, we're all going to be coming together. And, and some of that may have been, you know, true, but the other part of it was easy for them to latch on to, to become something, especially knowing that there's a possibility they can completely um, uh, manipulate our consciousness and our perception. I mean, these, these new age challenge, challenge it, Challenge, channelings, communications have been going on now for 60 years and, and we still don't know why the phenomenon is here. They haven't really addressed those issues. It's, it's a big red flag. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you have any more uh, to say in the, in the abduction phenomenon? Did you want I'd to like to touch on the hitchhiker aspect. Oh, absolutely. Moment. I've got my own theory on that. Okay. Let me bring the slide back up. Oh, oh, my apologies. Is that at the bottom? I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right at the bottom, yeah. Okay. Okay, you have your new okay. video. Just scroll back up a little bit. Okay. Right, so... Ah, thank you. ufology, the hitchhiker effect, and some research have noticed a correlation between poltergeist phenomena and people that have had abductions, and there's also been a correlation with researchers who visited Skinwalker Ranch. So are we, is there some link between spirits of the dead and aliens? Um, so I've got my own take on this, and I think the answer lies within parapsychology. If you look at what parapsychologists say about poltergeist phenomena, there's often an internal trauma, um, anxiety, or stress that builds up, and then bang, psych psychokinetic phenomena occurs within the person's environment so what my theory is that the invasive act of an abduction triggers like an internal trauma within the individual and that acts then as a, as a fertile ground for poltergeist phenomena now, i'm not saying everyone that has poltergeist phenomena um, is an abductee and not every abductee will experience poltergeist phenomena but i've got here um some interviews with dr stephen Bro brody um, a favourite guest of Jeffrey Mishlove's on his new Thinking Aloud channel, and he's talking about the basic mechanism as he sees it of poltergeist phenomena. He doesn't really touch on aliens, but just the mechanism about this internal trauma that individuals tend to have, which then manifests itself in the in the physical environment. And I I'd also, like to... sorry, oh, no, actually, I'd like you to finish before I jump in. Yeah, and there's also this other concept of a life force or chi. Um, I've done a video on that, on which I've embedded. Um, it goes back many thousands of years that all living things have got this life force energy that, that flows through them. And this could be part of the mechanism which then causes the poltergeist phenomena. So it's the marriage of mental thought and this life force energy jalling together, which then creates this phenomena. Yeah, what I wanted to throw in there was the interesting 
um, idea in, the, in some of the MyLab situations where um, the military causes trauma to the kids that they're, that they're putting through the situation to bring out their um, telepathic and psychokinetic and telekinesis mm. and all that. And I, I think it's kind of an interesting, um, mm. interesting juxtaposition or, or it's either way, the two ideas mm. that, you, that you have with pol poltergeist phenomenon and what supposedly happened in at the Montauk um, mm. uh, area is uh, it's, it's very interesting. I, and, and I would always wonder if it's, if it's very similar to the monsters movie where, you know, the, the kids would be scared and they get the, the, the energy from the kids and, and it always seems like there's some some kind of similarity where maybe they didn't have to do that. Maybe they could have gone a different direction with it. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, yeah. I, I just wanted to throw that out there. I think some researchers are joining too many dots and, and coming to the conclusion uh, that aliens um, are in contact with the spirits of the dead, which then leads down the avenue of they're not physical beings, they're multidimensional. Mm. And I, I think we need to back the bus up a bit and, and look at what parapsychology tells us um, about poltergeist phenomena, hitchhiker phenomena, and the fact that it may well lie within the person's mental environment being affected by the aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting. I, I, I um, the law of one is what I think of. There there is one small section where uh, Don Elkins is talking about um, the afterlife a bit, and um, mm -hmm. Rob mentions that some ETs. To, to people when they uh, pass are angelic. And I thought mm. that was kind of interesting, mm. but um, let's let's move on from that. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> further on here, um, you wanted to bring in Marshall V and Summers and the concept yeah. of life force. Yeah, so this is what I was just saying earlier that Marshall in his writings talks about this energy that flows through all sentient mm -hmm. beings or mm -hmm. life forms. And okay. it could be part of the mechanism that's used, the energy that's used um, which causes the poltergeist phenomena. Mm -hmm. It may be that some individuals exude more of this energy than others, mm -hmm. and that's why some people experience poltergeist phenomena yeah. and some don't. In my Life Force video, um, I look at a few psychics, Matthew Manning and a Russian lady from the 1940s, and as teenagers, they both experienced a lot of poltergeist phenomena, but they were able to sort of fine-tune it and hone it and Matthew Manning became a successful spiritual healer. So it could be that this life force energy that people start exuding involuntary and randomly through um, mental thought and, and concentration, they're able to hone that energy down and use it for altruistic purposes. Well, it's really interesting that um, it seems that some people are definitely better at it than others. I kind of look at it like superheroes because um, some people are, seem to be naturally psychic, like say, mm -hmm. um, well, we interviewed Lori Rayfeld and, and she said she had been um, experiencing phenomenon since she was three or five mm -hmm. years old. Um, another experiencer that we have, um, Caspian, who has a 125, 25 page report at uh, Bufog, Birmingham UFO mm -hmm. Group. Um, he's been experiencing it since he was a child and also it runs through the family. And it's it's yeah. very it's very very interesting how um, yeah some people seem to have and some don't because I'm definitely on the don't side, and mm. um, <laughs> but, but other people just seem I I have a friend who um, is a physics teacher and he says he has an uncanny ability to when they're trying to find a place or find something he can just say no wait just take a right take a right or take a left and mm. he said sometimes they can do it just some people seem to be uh, be more prone to having these abilities than others it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I think there's there's a genetic link, definitely. But I, I would urge, urge caution. I, I don't think it necessarily indicates that an individual is of a high spiritual nature. Well, mm -hmm. certainly not the aliens, because they, they demonstrate psychic abilities. So I don't think there's necessarily a correlation between um, psychic abilities and spirituality, necessarily. Yeah. No, yes. I think it's a genetic, it's a genetic thing um, through powers of the mind, concentration of the mind, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's I that's speculation that. on my part that one yeah i can oh, i can i can agree with that i uh it seems that it can be learned as well um mm -hmm. but some people just seem to have it and others don't and they have to learn it mm -hmm. um because i did try yeah. remote viewing um yeah. back in the 90s and eh, i was okay at it but i was very surprised it's really surprising when you 
start trying to do the controlled remote viewing and then you open up that envelope and go holy moly <laughs> that was really amazing but one, one uh, final thing i'll say about this uh, poltergeist phenomena hitchhiker phenomena barry taff a researcher a parapsychologist mm -hmm. uh, from ucla he noticed that it often precedes a physical abduction so it could mm -hmm. be there's sort of a mind scan that takes place prior to the abduction mm -hmm. which again that, that acts as that catalyst that fertile ground the mm -hmm. poltergeist phenomena to occur that, that that would be some amazing uh, studies to be to to read uh, about that phenomenon. That's that's mm. something else. Um, so I'll move on up and continue on over to which would you like to go to next? Uh, let's go for animal mutilations. It's like a quiz show, isn't it? You got to pick a topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. so animal mutilations, often called cat mutilations, but it involves all sorts of animals all around the world. Um, what I've tried to do on this page is, is bring in a bit of a British flavour to this phenomenon. Um, so there are a million and one reports of, of cows in Colorado, etc. Um, but I've got two examples on my site, um, two video uh, documentaries of um, some horses that were found mutilated okay. in some fields in England. Um, these were looked at by res researcher Richard D. Hall. Mm -hmm. um, typical injuries, you know, missing tongue, missing lips, missing eyes. No blood. Is, no blood. Um, the teats were removed as well from the female. Um, yeah, no blood. Uh, if you just keep scrolling down, we'll see the... Uh, keep going. Oh, here we go. Yeah, th those are the ones from America. But then further on down, I've got uh, some videos. Uh, this is interesting. Um, this guy sent me these two images. I don't know if they're genuine or not, but they appear to depict uh, a cow being pulled up into a craft. They were taken through um, the scope of a hunting rifle. Oh, so um, no, I've just I've just put those two in there. I don't know if they're genuine or not, but um, right, that's right. Give some I idea, a flavor of what how it may appear. Mm -hmm. If yeah, because uh, there are um, witnesses who who said that they saw the cow being raised in a yeah. beam of light, and um, this is probably what it pretty close to what it would look like. Yeah. Interesting. The I, I would guess this is a depiction because it looks like he just the the cow has ropes pulling it up so yeah, yeah but either way that's that's about what it looks like mm. this chap here is david kate and he's done a lot of valuable research with uh, animal mutilations in the uk he's looked at sheep and horses and cattle all around the uk and he was involved in the research on um, two horses that were found dead in some fields in england so this is one of the horses you can see the typical injuries mm -hmm. and there's a four-part documentary there um, which visitors to the site can read and watch. Okay, um, yeah, and, and typical injuries, yeah. Yeah, no and you can see no, no blood around the animal. No. Nope. The interesting thing, um, an autopsy was done, but it was never released to the farmer, so there was a bit of a cover-up going on. Oh. In, in the UK. That, and that uh, that was UK, is that what you said? Yeah, UK, yeah, UK case, and I autopsy. Can see autopsy was there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The Royal Society involved. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Say it again. RSPCA, the Royal Society for Royal Society for Protection of Cruelty to Animals. Yeah. So okay. they, they were involved as well. But um, yeah, the autopsy that was performed, um, the results were never revealed to the farmer, which is a bit odd. That is a bit odd. I mean, you'd mm -hmm. think that they would just uh, piecemeal some stuff out if they didn't want yeah. everything to be seen. Maybe is that a the... UK equivalent of FOIA? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> um we do have a foyer yeah but i don't think it's quite as um evolved as what you've got in the u.s mm -hmm. um i think with a lot of authorities if they say no they say no in the uk but i'm not an expert on the foyer process over here okay I, I i just recently read something about that someone saying uh that they were from the uk and, and on reddit and they were saying yeah when they say no that's pretty much mm -hmm. it you don't get anything so, so broad, broaden the flavour here. We've got some seals that were found um, off the shores of England, and they had curious spiral marks going around their bodies, um, which went down to just about the muscle level. So it mm -hmm. took the skin, the blubber, and a little bit of muscle spiraling all the way around. So, as you can imagine, that the sort of the, the rational viewpoint was it was a propeller from um, some sort of ship or boat. But yeah. when you look at the injuries, they're kind of it's quite a precise spiral, and we're, we're talking like 30, 50. 50 seals that were found in this manner. And if yeah, it was a propeller, surely it would be happening all the time, you know? There's right, been seals yeah. in the ocean for decades and there have been propellers in, yeah. the, in the sea for decades. 
Yes. Uh, another case another case around the UK, 30 seals were found. Uh, they're all decapitated on the third vertebrae. Oh. Uh, so that's a bit weird as well. <laughs> that is There's that one weird. that's been stripped back, revealing the skull. Okay. Oh. oh. There's a re rectal uh, incision that we often see in the cattle. Yeah. What you find a lot of these mutilations is they you have you have bodies with holes and they, they seem to suck out the innards. It could be organs, it could be muscle, but that, that seems to be the modus operandi. And this is one of the decapitations mm -hmm. severed at a specific vertebrae. I think about thirty seals were found um, with the, the same injuries. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. Before I went on your side, I'd never heard of this. This is mm. the. It's, Really yeah, just trying to broad, broaden the flavor. You know, it's not just cows. It's, it's all sorts of animals and land and Sorry. sea. Matt, what yeah. is APFU concluded that mutilations were UFO related? What is APFU? Uh, that's the Animal Pathology Field Unit. It's a, a private organization that was founded by some individuals um, back in, I think it was the late 1990s. And their aim was to look at these cases of animal mutilations around the UK and try and produce, you know, um, substantive reports on what they found apparently they had no problem uh with saying it was ufo related i'm guessing some of them must be in the yeah i mean these, these were private individuals so they didn't represent any official government agency so yeah they tend, tended to lean towards a, a, a yeah. ufo or yeah. a high, high strangeness at least yeah at the very least well that yeah and it's nice to have the the private agencies doing these this work and and then in bold there, that's an official line from the uh, UK government um, on animal mutilations. So the series of animal mutilation have been very distressing for the farmers and the majority of these incidents have been reported to the police as very serious offences and are being dealt with at, with them at present. As a result, it is not for the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food to pass comment on these incidents as they are being handled by the relevant authorities. So it's a bit of a mm -hmm. fob off. Yes, <laughs> we're not going to touch this. And there's, there's some foxes and deers again, just to show there's different animals involved. Yeah, yeah, it's not just cattle. No, which you wish would make sense if you're aliens coming from elsewhere. Why would yeah. you just pick on one specific animal? Yeah, yeah. Well, what I'm surprised to see, and I'm I'm guessing it, it might be just like abductions. Like we we only get maybe ten or twenty percent of people reporting them, but there's still. Yeah, to the ice cream, <laughs> yeah. More. But yeah. these are they're these are so unique. I mean, holes holes in the head and and uh yes, they're they're very unique. Eyes taken out, lips. They're, it 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 definitely yeah. uh points to some it just de definitely points to a mysterious origin when they're all the same. Holes holes in the bodies which look like it sucked something out, eyes taken out, lips taken out, a genital genitalia taken out. It's 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 a mystery, for for sure, and and yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go back up. Um, I think we get more biased towards um, cows because they're commercial livestock, uh, but they you know there could be lots of um, private animals out in the wilderness that are getting um, mutilated that we never really found about because there's not a commercial aspect to them. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so did you want to hit the next human? one? Yeah. Let's go for human. All right, here's the topic that no one likes to touch. Yeah. I think we should put out a big disclaimer right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, or a big yeah, warning yeah. rather, not a disclaimer. Yeah, well, it'll, it'll be on the thumbnail and everything else. But yes, there, yeah. there are definitely graphic pictures of human mutilation coming up. So just be beware. Not so, safe for work. Yeah. The first two things you notice about the human mutilations is they're a lot rarer um, than animal mutilations. Certainly what's in the public domain, um, there aren't as many cases as we see with animal mutilations. Um, and the second thing you notice, there are very few researchers that actually talk about this subject. Um, Richard D. Hall has done some excellent uh, research in the UK and Butch Wachowski uh, in the US um, has done some talks on human mutilations, but he sadly passed away recently. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a very disturbing part of the phenomenon and lends a lot of weight to the fact that uh, these beings are nefarious. And, and this is the sort of phenomenon that a lot of the new age element within ufology will tend to skirt around. Um, or you might get people saying, oh, yeah, a few percent of the aliens are bad, but the majority are good. You know, what are you basing your data on? Mm -hmm. But anyway, so um, 
him mutilation page. Um, I've listed them in chronological order, the cases I've come across. So mm -hmm. the first one um, is from 1956 occurred at White Sands uh, Missile Base. Which is very, um, let me let me put this, uh, yeah. throw this in, at White Sands, lots of stuff happens at White Sands. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting one that I hadn't heard before, and it's very interesting. There was a witness that saw the person being taken, but go ahead. Yeah, so uh, a chap, Sergeant Levette, was working out on the range, and he was with a senior officer, and then all of a sudden the officer heard this screaming noise, and he turned around and he saw the sergeant being lifted up by this arm up into a craft and then a, a big search took place uh, for his body, and it was found, I think it was about five or so miles away, um, mm -hmm. with classic mutilation injuries that we've just seen in the animals. Mm -hmm. um, eyes, lips, tongue missing. Um, but, yeah, it was oh, 10 miles away from the actual site of the abduction his body was found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it, and, and another interesting part of it is uh, what you had said is, it was dragged by a long serpentine arm oh, no. wrapped around his legs, connected to a silver disc hovering in the air 15 to 20 feet yeah. away. He was in close proximity to this. And again, these are uh, professional observers. They're in the military. Mm -hmm. So d that's that. I, I, I don't think I'd, I've heard of a, a, a serpentine type of arm that pulls somebody into the disc. Um, that's I think that was an yeah, it has to be a beam of light, doesn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the first. It's a shame we haven't got the actual autopsy report. What you find with some of these mutilation cases is a lot of word and mouth. Um, we've got no photographs. We've got no autopsy. So they, they vary in in um, you know the richness of the data that's included. Yeah, yeah. But and the source for that one was uh, Tony Dodd's book there. So I've got a source for the the information. Oh, yes. But, you know, potentially the first official case. Yeah. So the Dialoff Dialoff Pass incident. Um, a popular mystery within the world of uh, the unexplained. Um, ten hikers went off on an expedition. Um, they were based at a Russian polytechnic. Um, one decided to turn back early. I'm not sure why that was. Maybe he felt ill. Mm -hmm. And the nine carried on on their expedition. And within a few days, they were all found dead in strange circumstances. The official verdict was um, blunt force trauma on some of the victims and hypothermia on the others. And the interesting thing for this case, from a human mutilation point of view, is the injuries that occurred on one of the females in the group, Dubonina. Um, I've got, if you scroll down, I've got uh, a photo of the autopsy. So she was found in a kneeling position against like a rock face. And then when they performed the autopsy below, you've got classic mutilation injuries of missing eyes, uh, the tongue's gone, the lips are gone. Um, two of the victims had traces of radiation about their person, of which she was one. Okay. Um, so looking at it through the eyes of mutilation cases today, it could be a very early example of human mutilation. Now, for corroboration, the Farsight Institute, which carry out remote views, did three blind remote views on the Dartloff Pass incident, and all three described an aerial object which emanated energy down onto the individuals below. Uh, they didn't describe it as an alien spacecraft, but they didn't say it was something conventional either. And one of them described it like a, a ray of blue light that had never been seen before emanating from this object. This was, was the case where, from, sorry. This was the case where um, this it defied logic, where they they actually it looked like they had ripped their way from the inside out of their tents. It, yeah, they yeah, they night without clothes. adequate clothing. Yeah. And, um, they seem to have been trying to escape something that was, yes, that was inside the tent. Yeah, yeah, it's very bizarre. They they weren't fully dressed. They, the footprints show they all walked out in a sort of a, a linear one behind the other sort of pattern, and oh. and then you've got these peculiar injuries. And yeah, I think I, I think the Russian government tried to also uh, forward an explanation later on, saying that it possibly was related to some tests going on in the area or some some such. Yeah, they they. There's a theory that there was um, some sort of yeah test, some sort of explosion, and and it, it killed the people on the ground, and it was a you know a tragic accident. But okay. uh, how would how would an explosion just specifically take someone's lips, tongue, and eyes out, leave everyone else without those injuries? Um, yeah, and, and another explanation I I read a while back, which obviously couldn't possibly be it, but they said that there was an avalanche 
But yeah, Avalanche as well. Yeah, yeah. But how's that, that going to rip cool. someone's eyes out? And yeah, nothing mm. makes sense. And if it was a scavenger, why wouldn't it attack the other victims as well? And yeah. why would the scavenger uh, attack the person who's emanating radiation? Surely the animal with a hypersenses would have would have sensed mm, that one's a bit off. I'll, I'll pick one yeah. of the other victims. Yeah, yeah. There's there's there's. Um, I'd never really gone into the this the data love case, and mm -hmm. and when uh, I read your. Your information here, I, I I thought avalanche. No way! What are they thinking? Mm -hmm. So so yeah, this it's it's another case where that no one can explain it. Obviously, yeah. But there's people seem to find explanations though. So <laughs> yeah. So next one is Vietnam War. Now there's several Vietnam stories concerning human mutilations. Uh, there's one allegedly where a B fifty two was found on the ground and all the crew were mutilated. And there's this story, which comes from Leonard Stringfield. And basically, some soldiers were in the forest. They came to a clearing and they came across a, a bunch of grey aliens with human body parts. And they were putting them into cylinders and put them into the craft. And then a firefight ensued. And then, then when they reported their story to the superiors, they were taken away and wondered about speaking about it. Um, again, it's kind of anecdotal, but um, you know, who knows? If in war situations you could get a lot of dead bodies, so that may attract beings from above to take the cadavers away. Yeah, and there's there's that case that was in a um, that they did a really nice documentary on um, from Brazil. The uh, the one gentleman who I and I'm, again, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll put it down below if I if I find it. But um, um, when he he was taken into the craft he, he was told by his father go get the horses and so he he went out to the field and there was a craft out there he went through this this uh mist but um what's interesting is in the doc they didn't say anything about it but if you read the story he mentions that there were that there, they definitely were were cutting up or doing something to uh, the cattle parts and mm -hmm. and um when i read this story about these vietnam soldiers seeing these parts being put into the the, the mm. canisters it just it reminded me of that for some reason um but yeah. it, it, it's gruesome <laughs> and there's some bad aliens out there we don't know what they're doing with this there's an abductee in the 70s judy durati and when she was regressed she recounted seeing a aliens on board with a, with a with a cow and they were doing stuff to it okay. i think it's one of the few cases where an abductee's recounted animals on board mm -hmm. um so yeah there's another case there from idaho if we keep scrolling down sure um, this is the most famous case of human mutilation, the Guara, Guara Piranga Reservoir in Brazil, mm -hmm. near Sao Paulo. Again, classic mutilations. With this one, um, we've got a lot of colour photos, and we've actually got the autopsy report um, that was performed by medical staff. Um, so we keep scrolling down. So you've got the typical lips. You know, the likeness of that to the, the Russian female is uncanny, you know, the, the, the missing lips and tongue and eyes. Mm -hmm. And you've got a several decade time span between them. Mm -hmm. um, like with the animals, you've got holes all over the body where um, the insides have been sucked out. Often a lot of the organs are missing and the, 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 the chest collapses. Mm -hmm. Rectal um, suction as well. Yeah, it's it's... It's pretty gruesome, and it, again, the uh, I would wonder, like, are these holes? Uh, I wish I knew more about my uh, the the body, but if these holes are right over that main artery that goes there, so it's just an easy place. But mm -hmm. again, the holes are in different places too. You you got them. What well, this was over on the shoulder blade or the yeah yeah. The chest. It's just strange stuff. I think to get initiated, you might say it's sort of a, a drug gang bullet holes, but um, when you've got an actual doctor. He's probably quite familiar with gunshot wounds in Brazil. Oh, yeah. I think you can quickly determine whether um, they're gunshot wounds or not. Again, mm -hmm. you can see the lack of blood around this victim. This, mm -hmm. this is this was one that was sent to me. I, I didn't find this one. Um, I got very little information, but again, looks you see see the lips missing. Yep, and um, no eyes and the holes in the arms. Yeah, uh, yeah. it almost centers around the sensory organs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I touch now on alleged human mutilations in, in the UK. Um, there were allegedly some cases um, that took place, place over a period of three weeks in a field in North Yorkshire um, where mutilated individuals were found by hikers. Um, there's a case of a male and a female that were found on top of the Brecon Beacon Mountain, Talabot Mountain in Wales in 1990. When they found their vehicle, 
the seats had been ripped out in an odd manner. Hmm. Um, and then a search ensued, and eventually they found the male and the female. I think the female was missing the usual eyes, tongue. I think her breasts were missing. Um, I think they were both totally hairless as well. All the hair had been removed from their body. Hmm. Uh, genitals had been removed um, and quickly covered up by the authorities. Tony Dodd, who's now deceased, a famous UFO researcher in the UK, he allegedly saw um, colour photos of this incident, um, of these two victims um, that were taken by a special forces guy who claimed he was part of a NATO group that was sent out to go around the world when these sort of events took place. And their job was to seal off the area. And then a team of scientists would come in and, and collect all the, uh, all the evidence. That's fascinating. Mm. And I, I've got a series of um, documentaries, once again, by the great Richard D. Hall, um, covering human mutilations and the, this alleged special forces NATO group um, that go around the world. I think this individual claims to have seen 30 to 40 mutilated bodies, hmm. uh, more more female than males, apparently. Oh. Um, a lot of this group um, ended up getting radiation poisoning. Sometimes they would come near the proximity of craft. Um, this guy's now got MS, which can be... Um, a, a, which you can get as a function of uh, exposure to radiation. Hmm. Um, so you're so, saying Derek, Derek Goff said that he he had seen... Derek, of- Derek, De- basically, um, the Special Forces guy who's named Anonymous showed 11 photos to Derek Goff. Oh, I'm sorry. And then showed them to Tony Dodd. And then Richard D. Hull got involved in the case. He never saw any of the photos, but he was able to interview Derek Goff and the Special Forces guy and Tony Dodd. That's uh, yeah, it's amazing. Because mm-hmm. well, I mean, it just says it right there: thirty to forty mutilated human beings. Mm-hmm. You don't, and again, you don't hear about this. You don't want mass hysteria going on. But it, it sounds far fetched. But you know, if discs have been crashing since the forties, and humans and animals have been mutilated for yeah. several decades, yeah. it would make sense that you would have some sort of infrastructure in place to mm-hmm. go around to sites and seal the areas off and yeah. gather your data. Yeah, kind of the same idea with the um, crash retrievals. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. but but the the tough thing for the military is the some of the townspeople, usually the firefighters, the police officers, and stuff, get to go see it, and mm. then they call the military, and of course everything gets uh, mm. cordoned off and uh, yeah. covered up. But it seems the level of cover up is is beyond the norm. It's it mm. goes it's so stringently controlled that it doesn't even leak out. To the same extent yeah. as other stuff that has leaked out. Yeah, when, when you when you think um, how me- how much security um, is involved in all these cases, security personnel, I mean, that are keeping stum. You know, it's not just the high ranking officers in in the Pentagon. There's obviously a lot of you know troops on the grounds that are keeping secret and keeping their mouths shut. You know, decade after decade. Yeah, it must be some sort of an NDA that they're forced to sign off on. Mm. Uh, which well, puts all I think, their pensions and everything at risk if they if they open up. Well, as as Larry Summers was saying when um, after the Bentwaters case, when um, the uh, the guy came in for for their de- debriefing, he said it. it th- he just continued to repeat your loyalty, your loyalty, your loyalty to the United States, your loyalty to the military, your loyalty. And so he was saying that it was total, he goes, oh, this was brainwashing. They're totally just, Mm -hmm. he just kept hammering this in so we wouldn't say anything. It's your loyalty to your country, your loyalty. So it might be very similar in this case. Like you can't say anything. Mass hysteria could happen. People might gain awareness and actually want us to do something about this. I, I think, think there's a threat of losing your pension as well. And also it might be so out of yeah. the everyday paradigm that yeah. the person wants to bury their memories and, and try and forget about it. It yeah. was a way as a coping mechanism. Yeah. I'd, I'd say it's all of the above. I mean, there's so yeah. many, so many pieces of it of why they wouldn't tell. Mm. Um, okay. So another not safe for work, not safe for anything, but yeah, this, this is probably the worst one. I find this one really hard to look at, but this was a 17 year old female. Again, there's a theme with Brazil. I'm getting a lot of um, cases here in Brazil. Um, again, if you scroll down, we've got the classic okay. um, English injuries. Right. So here we go. Um, I'm not going to stand up too long, but here yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Let me just talk about it. Okay. 
there's there's a correlation with a cat mutilation, similar injuries, the eyes, lips, mm-hmm. tongue missing. Right. So with this one, this is quite an interesting case because um, initially a guy was arrested um, for the murder, but mm-hmm. he was later acquitted. There, there's a photo of him there. Mm-hmm. Um, here once again, another cat, uh, cat mutilation, another uh, another human mutilation case, um, again from Brazil. Um, this time a female, 17 years it old. Seems, it seems the... I think in Brazil, the whole topic of the whole phenomenon, the UFO phenomenon, is more actively discussed in other countries with a little yeah. more support and openness from the government. Yeah, it, which might skew the fact that it appears to be more common in Brazil. But as you say, it might just be the fact that there's a the culture of openness, which is why we're getting more leaks from Brazil than from other parts of the world. I, I, um, I would almost say all of South America, yeah. to, to some aspect, again, uh, I, I, you know what else I think about when I think of South America or Brazil are um, the old stories of, of, I believe some of the Nazis went somewhere down in South America and Argentina. Yeah, yeah. and okay, thank you. And and again, this could be conspiracy. So, but it, it also makes me think of um, other correlations of um, the said UFO bases that are down there as well. But they're all over the world. So mm-hmm. I, th- I think it is more of what you're saying. Um, what you're both saying is that there's just more openness to talking about the uh, UFO issue down there. Yeah. But yeah, so this guy was, um, but I, I wonder if was he ever charged? Well, I guess it doesn't matter. No, he was, he was released. He was released. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I'm sure they said, well, how did you do that to her? He's like, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. No blood, eyes gone, lips gone. Yeah. He, he was, you know, these are literally crimes against humanity. Whatever intelligence is doing these, you know, is uh, digging a big karmic hole. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, yes, yeah, so you made the comparison between the calf and the human mutilation. Mm. And again, they're all almost exactly the same. Yeah. Which, which brings up the issue of why Linda Moulton Howe doesn't really talk about human mutilations. Uh, I don't find it a massive conceptual leap. Um, if, if you accept aliens are abducting people and they're mutilating cattle, it's not a big leap for me to think they'd be doing it to humans as well. It's not a big leap. And I, I would um, love to ask Linda if she's just not been doing it for the simple um case of the mass hysteria or people just not wanting to hear that Mm -hmm. no it's 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 it needs to be said it needs to be known that Mm -hmm. there's bad aliens somehow somehow our minds are more accepting of a cattle mutilation than a human mutilation it just hits too close to home and it's it's just too disturbing to even think about probably yeah. I think as well, you, you're showing the bodies of loved ones. So if you're making a leap with UFOs, it could be a bit sensitive for the family as well. Yeah. Um, so there's that aspect. Yeah. I mean, again, you said your loved ones. And, and in that last photo, unfortunately, mm. she was a 17-year-old girl. And probably the sheer, the sheer graphic aspect of it makes it easier for agencies who have the information to, to keep people in control about leaking the information. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll move on to this one. one more. Another one again. You, you can see you can see the the constant repetition with the the style of injuries. Yeah, eyes, lips, the whole. So sort of straight thing. away you can see. Yeah, that's one of them. Yep. <laughs> and now yeah. there's just a series of embedded videos uh, that Richard D. Hall um, okay. made about the UK aspect to human mutilations. Okay. Which people can wade through in their leisure if they wish. Did you say that you had just recently uploaded these? Yeah, they've been on the YouTube for years, but right. yeah, I've recently added them to make make my uh, data a bit more fuller and richer. Yeah, yeah, no. I'll it's surprising it. YouTube has not taken them though. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was I wondering. Said, <laughs> sorry, Paul. <laughs> no, I said that's what I was gonna was wondering mm-hmm. with this uh, interview. Um, if there's any issue, what I'll do is I'll just cover it up and make it a more safe for work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. it, so it doesn't get taken down because this is important. Yeah. Yeah, Tony Dodd, um, he, he talks um, at the end, or the, there's a recording of a lecture he gave back in the late 90s, I think it was, and the cover story for the mutilation in this field was that manic, some joker had put mannequins um, in the field um, and the, you know, the press always, always take the uh, rational explanation and didn't probe it any further. That's because they they just want to leave it at that, and I'm sure the military yeah. is right behind them saying, "Great job, yeah, great job." 
Okay, so I'll head back. But I just to have to say these these individuals who have taken the time and effort to actually investigate this at risk to themselves and their reputations uh, need to be commended. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, would you like to go to missing people or UFO yeah, attacks? Yeah, missing people, please. <laughs> this is I'm the sure four one one phenomenon. I remember David Pollide's in here, so I'm yeah, sorry, and and, and for seeing <laughs> for stepping on you. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So yeah, there's a mug shot of uh, David there. He's well known for his missing four eleven series of books where where people we noticed a a correlation with. Uh, disappearances in national parks and high strangeness associated with the victims. Um, when people disappeared, there'd often be no trail for sniffer dogs to, to follow as if people were being pulled up from the ground. And when people did reappear, normally dead, it was normally in an area that had already been searched extensively. Um, so I've cited some cases here. Um, so some some of them, like the children, often do reappear alive. Uh, not always, um, but the first case, the, the kid reappeared um, f a few days later. He was found four thousand feet up in elevation in bare feet. Um, poor weather conditions. Three year old boy. Now, and then we've got the case of James McGrogan, who was going off on a hike with a group of uh, friends and. Somewhere along the hike, he decided to go on a bit further. He, he said he'd uh, just check out ahead. And then he disappeared. Um, extensive search took place, sniffer dogs. Um, they found his body four and a half miles away, um, lying face down. He didn't have his footwear on, and he still had a working GPS and phone. So the question is, if he got lost off the trail, why didn't he radio his group? Um, I think yeah, he had a... A, da a broken rib cage, uh, broken femur, and severe head trauma. So it could have been that he'd been dropped down from above. I think he was on an ice. Ladies actually made two documentaries. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, these these are from some of Pallades, uh or Pallades. These are some of his cases. Yeah, yeah. And and I was going to say another interesting of high interesting thing about high strangeness was I don't I don't know if it was that one, but there was another one where a child was missing. And when the child was found again in the forest and the child said that um, uh, on, in this, there's actually two of them. One of them, a child said that a, a girl with a flashlight had found them and, and helped them along. Turned out a girl had died years before and she had a flashlight. That was definitely high strangeness. And then another one mm -hmm. where the child had said the, a bear had had taken it in and, and helped it out. But anyways, that's it. I just mm -hmm. <laughs> thought those were strange and definitely cases of high strangeness. Mm -hmm. But there's and one, one there's well. one story at the at the end. Sorry, no, go ahead. There, there's one story at the end of uh, the second documentary, which is called "The Hunted," where this lady actually was out deer hunting, and um, she saw some sort of a anomaly in the forest that she could not explain. It almost looked like something that was translucent, but walking through the forest. And I think I feel something like that. Yeah, it's it's almost comparable to the 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 creature in the in the in the predator right the movie mm -hmm. uh, where it, it sort of shape shifts but it's it's translucent you can actually see through it but you it's not solid mm -hmm. but you can see a walking motion and she actually saw something like this mm -hmm. uh, moving through the forest she tried to click a photograph of it but uh, it didn't turn out too mm -hmm. good but that's As what you experience <laughs> firsthand yeah and then um, the other interesting part of the uh, of these type of things is is usually when the people are found they're found in a place that was already Has searched. searched yeah and, yeah yeah the, that's, that's like Oxy's case um he went to, he disappeared he was out on a deer hunting trip he didn't return back home extensive search took place they found his shoe 75 foot up a tree and then his body was found 25 yards away from his house and the area had been searched already several times and his, mm -hmm. his body appeared 36 hours later um this is an interesting one, Jared Atadero. Um, he, he went walking with a group. Uh, he disappeared. Big search oh, yeah. ensued. Um, didn't find any any trace of him. Then several years later, some hikers were hiking. And uh, I think 500 feet above the trail where he disappeared, they found a child's tooth, a piece of skull, and Jared's clothes. Um, so several anomalies here. Um, if a cougar had taken him, his, his top would have been ripped apart. You can see it's totally... Uh, intact 
Um, there's some bits missing from his trousers. Um, what the observation there is that some birds may have used it for nesting material. Um, but the weirdest thing of all was his, um, I think you say tennis shoes in America, we say trainers. Um, okay. They, they were found um, in such good condition that it, it didn't seem compatible with being out in the elements for about four or five years. Mm-hmm. And also the child tended to walk with his laces undone. So the chances of him walking and still having both of his uh, trainers together um, after some distance is a bit strange. Yeah. And same Um, thing, this area that it was found was searched. Yeah. This this area was searched. There was no no sniffer trail. Um, There was no blood found on his clothing. There was no animal hairs found on the clothing. Mm -hmm. Um, His his, his, um, trousers were inside out as well. That's a little bit odd. Oh, yeah. Um, he's found. Um, now, with this one, um, I came across a remote viewing group. About eight to ten remote viewers have remote viewed this case. Um, mm-hmm. I've got a, a picture at the end of, of what they all drew, but they all drew a, a circular or tube-like object. It's a little bit small on the picture, but you can just make out circular objects and some tube-like objects that were above the boy. They all came up with this this correlation of an aerial object. Let me uh, Let me see if I can... I zoomed in, so hopefully... Oops, it's almost, to like, it's almost like something is toying, toying and dropping tantalizing bits of evidence all over the place. Yeah, because yeah, the logical question is, why, why, why would they just hide the body or, or dispose of it somewhere else? They sort of want to leave it. Maybe they want to see how, I, how our psychology works, how we, how we deal with fear, um, what, what mental processes do we go through to try and ascertain what's going on. So it, it could be, you know, a, a sort of them watching it and see how we process things. Well, that that would uh, bring me to uh, <clears throat> that little law of one excerpt I, I sent to you where um, the, that where Ross stated, well, whenever they pull pieces and parts, it's also a symbolog- symbology of, of, of how we see things and, and to it's to strike fear in, in the consciousness. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it could be anything. It's we, we just it could don't. be a show of strength, a show of arrogance. You know, yeah. we, we can take your cattle at will, and we'll we'll just drop them back down, and you can sort it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll watch you sort it out and study you mm-hmm. in more ways than one. Okay, increase the fire, the the fear psychosis among the general yeah. public. Yeah. Okay. That's the Totsi's case that I, I mentioned earlier. So he went out um, one morning oh. looking for deer. Um, with this one as well, I forgot to mention earlier, um, a fisherman and um, two other guys actually saw a human being beamed up into a craft. Um, really? Which is, yeah. Uh, just, I think I, I mentioned it towards the end of the uh, text. Okay. Um, there we are. A two fishermen and a farmer said they saw a large Rembrandt object just above the power lines with the guy in his underwear being pulled up into the craft. So he went out and he had a one-piece cam- camera suit on. He had a T-shirt, um, cut off jeans, uh, socks and boots. So at some point that one piece suit came off, his footwear came off and then he was dragged up. And like I say, one of his uh, shoes was found up in a tree about 75 foot. So it was, you know, whether it dropped off in some part of the process. Yeah. It's quite a yeah. correlation. A lot of these cases, the footwear is missing. Like with <laughs> yeah. the Dr. James Brogan. It, it, and and it, well, uh, why would I, I almost said it would make sense? Well, I don't know why it would make sense, but it's 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 definitely interesting and and to think that there were witnesses on this one, or witnesses that said they saw him being taken up into a craft. Um, that, the only I put thing in the end here as well, Butch Butch Wachowski in 2016, um, he tried to launch some FOIA requests against the police, state police that handled the case. And they said, well, we can't tell you anything because the case is still open. But they said earlier the official cause of death was a cocaine overdose. So huh. if, it, if that's the case, the case is closed. So they should be able to release FOIA requests. So, you know, go around in circles. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. It was a cocaine overdose, yet witnesses saw him being taken up into a craft. Yeah. And, yeah. and he okay. his body appeared in an area they'd already searched several times. So this is a famous, uh, no relation to uh, George Gamsky from the 1950s. Um, so a, mi- a miner went missing one afternoon. Um, his body was found 20 miles away, five days later, on top of a coal tip. A um, couple of odd things about this. Um, when his body was uh, observed, 
Um, there were no marks of cold. You imagine dragging someone up a coal tip 10 feet high, they'd be covered in coal dust. Yeah. His, his uh, clothing was immaculate. Um, he had a, his suit jacket, but his, his shirt was missing. Um, he had a look of horror etched on his face. Ugh. There was a strange gel-like substance um, around his neck and, and some burn marks. Um, an autopsy was performed that day, and I think it said he died of cardiac arrest. Scared to death. An open verdict ruling that, that Adamski had died of a heart attack. So missing for five days. This was the other thing as well. With this case, he had one day's worth of beard growth, but he'd been missing for five days. Mm. That's a bit of a weird one. Yeah, and the other odd thing with this was the policeman that found him, Alan Godfrey, um, had a UFO sighting some time later, and he had missing time, and he was regressed. And there's some drawings of, uh, if you scroll down, of the craft he saw, and he had a typical sort of grey abduction. So you've got the initial anomaly of Adamski's miss missing and, and death, and then you've got the abduction by the policeman that found him. That's that's fascinating. Not circular event. Um, I'd, I'd also like to, to note it's interesting because it looks like on the top of this coal heap or pile, um, he's. It looks like he's been dropped from a high place because it looks like he's, yeah. he's pushed it down and in. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's an amazing case. And he's you know twenty miles away from where he went missing. Yeah, twenty miles. Wow. Mm. And he and he was a miner, a coal miner. Uh, no, he no, he wasn't a miner. I can't remember what his occupation was, but the, he was dumped on top of this coal tip. Okay, okay, that's that's why I thought he was a coal miner. Yeah. I thought, okay, but this was twenty miles from his abduction. So. Yeah. Oh, I think he went off to the shops one afternoon, and that was the last anyone saw of him alive. Wow. Okay, and then that's and that's it. And there's just a the link. Um, David Polite, he's talking about the uh, Adamski case and some young girl that disappeared that was found dead. Okay. And Dave Polide's doing God's work there. But I think they're all strong cases. Those ones there, they're all they're all oh, yeah. got a lot of high strangeness associated with them. I mean, there are obviously going to be cases where people disappear and there's a rational explanation. They may have committed suicide or. Yeah. Just want to start a new life somewhere, but yeah, there's these odd ones that um, yeah. seem to lean towards a. A UFO possibility, right? But what do you do with the ones where there's witnesses that say they saw the yeah. person being taken up into a yeah. crowd? I mean, those are the mm -hmm. those are the cases where you got to scratch your head. Yeah, um, I think the easiest thing is to discredit the witness, and then it all goes away. Yeah, yeah. So move on. Um, UFO attacks? Is that what we got now? Yeah, let's go for that one. There's so much of. Absolutely eye-opening information on your website, Matt. It's amazing. You've done an amazing yeah. job putting all this together. And I try to be sort of no BS, so I, I'm not one for waffles. So I'm, I'm trying to make each section just very sort of um, rich in data and not in waffle. Do you know what I mean? And um, right. I'm trying to embed videos that I find that sort of uh, hide or help the the case. You know, absolutely. Um, so this is Calares. This is all based about Calares. Um, so starting in June 1977, um, some fishermen were seeing objects coming out of the water. Um, then it evolved, and I think about 12 different types of metallic craft were being seen. And they mm -hmm. literally started zapping the locals. Um, sort yep. of pencil beam of light would emanate from these craft. It would hit their skin. Um, Again, Brazil. Yeah, in yeah. Brazil, yeah. Another, yeah. Um, they would, they'd have marks, scar marks on their body. Um, I think the area would turn black and hair would fall out. Mm -hmm. uh, it was looked at by Jacques Vallée years later, um, and he thought there was some sort of pulsed microwave technology being used that was causing these injuries. Um, there was one doctor, only one doctor in the area, so she literally did all the uh, medical analysis uh, on the uh, victims. She were, didn't believe them either, too. She didn't believe them either for uh, until she finally saw it herself. Um, yeah. And that was weeks or, or months. No, either way, I think it was weeks after uh, the initial victims would come in with their issues. Several months after the phenomenon started, the Americans came in and they gave the Brazilian Air Force a lot of uh, better technology, cameras, film. Um, it's alleged that the uh, Brazilian Air Force took about 15 hours worth of video film, um, several hundred photos and many hundreds of pages of documents. They did do a, a slight leak of information. I think it was in the 2000s. They, they leaked out some photos 
and some documents, but they've never released, to the best of my knowledge, any of the video. Like I said, they've got about 15 hours worth of um, video film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And two and then people I... died as well. Most, most were injured. Two people did die. Yes. Um, from their injuries. Yep. yep. Um, again, you know, it doesn't look particularly um, friendly and benign to me. <laughs> no. And the two reporters there um, also were able to get some uh, information. They were given. Yeah. I, I remember seeing the documentary for it where they were given, uh, they, they can go to is, and check out the files. I don't know that they were given all the files, but. Um, I see. Yeah, I think it was a, a limited look, but I, I yeah. think, I think the Brazilian Air Force had some sympathy with a lot of the um, amateur researchers. So I, I think they you know, allowed them to have a, a look at uh, yeah. some, some of the records on it. But um, there was an interview um, with this chap. He was one of the senior officers involved in the case. And he, he mm-hmm. recounts a really bizarre story where one of these, because some of the beings were sighted. Um, I can't remember on the ground or they were seen through the craft, but they were sort of grey like, you know, beings three, four, three, four foot tall. Mm. And he recounts one of these ventures actually grabbing him from behind. Yeah. It was a um, hug. Yeah, it was a hug. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> yeah, possibly a hug. Um, I think, I think this yeah. was where it was. It happened in his bedroom. It, he experienced this in his yeah. own bedroom. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, um, I, I thought he did claim it was it was like it hugged him. It like put it yeah from behind. And it, it, from behind. Sort of, like, he message. I can't remember what it said, but um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he 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 committed suicide not long after this interview. So whether it was a connection with the trauma um, of what he'd experienced and you know mm-hmm. in his in his consciousness for many years, but um, I think it's an alleged suicide. But it it the the okay, circumstances yeah. of how the body was found kind of points differently. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that muddies the waters even more. <laughs> yeah, well, it seems to happen a lot. Yeah. Um, so this, this is a one of the photos that was taken at the time. You can see the – some people, I think, recounted sort of like the sensation of blood being taken out of their, their system yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... There's just the descriptions from people. Oh, okay, gotcha. Know. And this is a f- absolutely fabulous. I would urge people to watch this. Um, there's a YouTube channel called Red Panda Koala, and he does really high quality videos on various UFO topics. And he's done a three parter on Kalares, but yeah, his guy's superb. So credit to him. I, I put his uh, embedded his uh, documentaries on that page. Yeah, I think that's where I saw the documentary. It was yeah. Red Panda Koala. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing stuff. Mm. I might add more to that in future because there's, there's, you know, there's cases where pilots have had issues with craft, but I think with those, they tend to be where the craft gets in close proximity to the, the UFO rather than the UFO being actively going after the aircraft. Um, so I, yeah, might, I might fill that up with some more cases if I come across them. Yeah, there are there are few cases where um, where we know that the, the, the craft shot back or down the, air, air, the mm-hmm. jet or the airplane. Yeah. Um, and we do know that there's also cases where the uh, military, whether it be Russian or U.S., shot at the craft and downed the craft, which mm-hmm. sounds crazy, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it, uh, apparently it's happened. Um, I wish Remzi were here; he would he'd be able to tell us which cases those were. But I, I don't remember which ones they it's were. It's very hard remembering time, state, places with all these uh, different things. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, well, especially for me doing these interviews and then having yeah. to remember things, it's like ah, I'm. Brain yeah. Part. Was it 1958 or was it 1959? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, we'll go on to the conclusion, and this is uh, okay. what I, I'm sure everyone is looking forward to because there are good things to think about about what yeah. we need to do. Mm. Okay. So up to now, I've listed what I think is going on, which it doesn't take a genius to realize that it's nefarious. There's nothing positive of what I've, what I've talked about so far. Um, so in my conclusion, I start off with what Linda Moulton Howe was told by a retired defense intelligence analyst. Um, she was told that the, the U.S. Um, is trying to understand and cope with three competing and in conflict extraterrestrial civilizations. So we're dealing with ETs. Well, that's what she was told. They're not humans from the future. They're not multidimensional. They're not some parallel civilization. They're, they're life forms from elsewhere. There's more than one group coming here. And they all want this planet for themselves, and they're all in competition with each other. So, going forwards with that idea, um, some time ago, someone sent me a link to a website called the Allies of Humanity. And the Allies of Humanity are allegedly a group of physical aliens. They're acting as cosmic spies. What they're doing, 
they're watching the activity of the beings on Earth and reporting back via channeling to a man called Marshall of Ian, Marshall of Ian Summers, um, a gentleman that resides in Colorado. Um, what the Allies say is that you aren't going to get any answers from these visitors here. They've had 75 years to tell you what they're doing and they're not going to do it. Um, they're just creating a lot of confusion and there's a lot of secrecy. So I'm very sceptical of channeling. I looked at it myself in the early 90s. I started off nuts and bolts and then came across the idea of channeling. I thought, wow, this is amazing. All these people are in contact with aliens. This is amazing. <laughs> so I started reading all these channeling books. I think I boosted the economy of the West Coast of California because that's where a lot of them emanate from. And initially I thought, oh, this, this stuff sounds great. They're talking about ascension and they're going to land soon and they're going to sort out all our problems. This is great. But then at the back of my mind, I, I had this sort of nagging doubt that, it wasn't really telling me about the phenomenon that I see within the subject. It's not telling me about the trauma that abductees go through. It's not telling me about why animals are being mutilated, um, why people are going missing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, bearing that in mind, initially when I when I started reading the Alice of Humanity, I was extremely sceptical. But I quickly noticed, first of all, it was written in very plain English. There was none of that new agey flowery language that you get with a lot of channeled material and it directly addressed all the phenomenon that I talked about. Um, so it really resonated with me. And, you know, I read all four volumes of the allies of humanity. And then I started looking at um, the writings of Marshall V and Summers. So going on to Marshall now in the eighties, he claimed to have had contact from what he describes as an angelic presence now, this is a group of beings that are spiritual beings. They're not physical and they're not aliens. They're like advanced entities that are overseeing uh, what goes on on Earth from a sort of a spiritual advancement point of view. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a spiritual connection with these ETs that Marshall has been in contact with. So there's like a triangle between Marshall, the spiritual presence, and this group of physical aliens. Um, so basically, Marshall was given a mission in his life to channel information from this angelic presence. And it was also part of his mission to channel the information that these this group of physical aliens have given him. OK, so just to start with then, what, what essentially the Allies of Humanity is saying is there are several groups of aliens that are visiting this planet they're multiracial, so each group consists of different races. They're hierarchical, and at the bottom of the rung, the operator is like a very strong hive mind, and they have very little freedom in what they do. They're almost robotic-like. Um, some people tend to think they are actually robots, but they've essentially evolved along a path where they become very non-emotional and just have very specific tasks to perform. And like I say, they're operating at this group hive mind. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to break there because I've lost my thread. <laughs> that's, okay. that's, that's okay. I'm trying to get my words that correctly. Um, so these this group of these groups of beings, they're in competition with each other. And essentially what they're doing, they're creating hybrids between themselves and us. And what they're going to do is to put those hybrids in positions of power within the world so they can effectively control the planet and we would essentially be their workforce. So it's been done, being done very clandestinely over a period of time um, and they're generating a lot of confusion, which we see within the UFO movement. So it's very difficult for people to pin down exactly what is going on. Um, I've said before that the visitors have had 75 years to tell us what they're doing and they failed to do that. You've got lots of conflicting narratives within channeling. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of clarity with what the Allies of Humanity are saying about the visitors. Um, so as well as creating hybrids, um, they're taking animals and humans, they're mutilating them, um, partly for their own experiments. And allegedly, there's also a trade in human body parts throughout the galaxy as well. It's like a black market for body parts, things like mm -hmm. chlorophyll and plasma that they're quite interested in. Um, some people are taken on board craft and they're brainwashed and they'll go back to Earth 
and they'll act as spokespeople for the aliens. You'll see them on podcasts saying how wonderful the aliens are. And you can show those people human mutilation photos really blue in the face, but then they're not going to budge because they, they've effectively been brainwashed. So the method, the modus operandi that these visitors use is the power of persuasion in the mental environment. It's not, it's not being done through guns and lasers. It's been done very clandestinely through persuasion. So they're influencing people in positions of power, in, in government positions, in religion, and in commerce. Um, they've got underground bases all around the world. Some of these bases have got antennae in, which they're sending out um, persuasive subliminal messages to the populaces around, again, to sort of get them thinking the right way of mind. Um, what they're trying to do is to weaken humanity and for them to lose faith in authority figures. So they, people then will naturally look to an outside force to come in and sort out the world's problems. But what Marshall says is very important is for people not to lose faith in their leaders, because if you start doing that, you're opening the door, you're inviting outside forces to come in and um, potentially take over due to the people's lack of faith in authority figures. Um, so that's essentially what's going on. It's a secret program of hybrids being created and which will be put in positions of power um, so that the aliens will then have a control over our planet. They see our planet as a big resource of mm -hmm. flora, fauna, um, rare metals, etc. cetera. Um, what Marshall was... I was going to say real quick about um, losing faith in your in your leaders. I was yeah. going to say it's okay to lose faith in your leaders. Just vote new leaders in, not ask for some higher mm. force outside of um, outside of the earth mm. to come help and make everything better because that's our job. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and <laughs> you, you do touch on the idea as well that um, trinkets from space have been offered to certain uh, military. Uh, organizations um, once you start doing that you potentially become reliant on the on the uh, giver of the uh, trinkets you know if you give someone a car and you've got the keys to the machine you'll do almost anything to get hold of those keys so th th there's been situations where there have things have been gifted to certain personnel mm -hmm. but there's an ulterior motive to that and it's oh, one yeah. of uh, making the individuals vulnerable um, you know, we'll we'll give you a craft if you let us do this, that, and to to your population sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, that idea has been around in ufology for several decades now, but that's yeah. one of the things that the Alice of Humanity reinforce. Um, the other thing that Marshall touches on, because he, he prim primarily described himself as a spiritual teacher, and what he talks about is the idea that all sentient beings in the universe, including us, have what's called a spiritual mind, as well as our, our normal everyday mind. And what he's saying is, through taking meditation steps, you can allow your spiritual mind to influence your everyday mind more and more. So it can start to sort of uh, rough out the edges that you have in your personality. You, you might be materialistic. You might be, um, you might not care about the environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what Marshall's saying is, through taking what he describes steps to knowledge, you can allow this spiritual mind to open out like a flower and influence your your everyday mind and all sentient beings have this knowledge that's knowledge with a capital k this spiritual power within them but some beings like a lot of these aliens although they've got that potential they become totally atrophied from it um so it's quite a, an interesting concept and it applies to all sentient beings within the universe they all have this spiritual mm -hmm. energy within them it comes from the creator is this idea that when creation started, all sentient beings were given this spiritual power, this, mm -hmm. this gift from the creator. Mm -hmm. And we go through a cycle of reincarnations. All sentient beings are going through a cycle of reincarnations. And the idea is that you, over time, you allow the spiritual power within you to manifest more in your everyday physical life. And then that's how you evolve spiritually. And eventually then you, you make your way up step by step back to the source. I mean, it, it's some of it is a general idea that you get within um, New Age New Age talk, this idea about you're going through a series of cycles of incarnations, yeah. and each time you get a bit more wisdom and you make your way back up the mountain. Mm -hmm. But that's something that Marshall talks about a lot, the spiritual power within mankind. Mm -hmm. And once you get a, a certain connection to it, um, this is a connection with aliens, you become immune from you become immune from their persuasions. You, you, you have such a solid mental environment that these aliens ca can't really touch you. They can't persuade you or influence you, which they are doing to a lot of people.
Well, I, I definitely like that. The idea of that, um, because as you said, there's, there's other flowery words of, of, of saying that and I'll, I'll go back to the LL research group who did the raw material, the law of one, but, but before they, they channeled raw, they channeled quo and a few other ones who talk flowery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but there's apparently supposed to be like at six dense density a very high density being um and apparently they're also part of i'm i'm gonna guess they're part of these allies but because they say that they're in the confederation but nonetheless one of their biggest um things that they say in um I, don elkins originally wrote a book called secrets of the ufo and Don Elkins was a physicist. He was a teacher. He was an airline pilot. He um, was a ufologist, and and he loved ufology. He did um, uh, he did investigations on his own. He even um, did some experiments with Yuri Geller, and um, and um, one of uh, I guess I'll just do a little thing on Don Elkins. He he um, was very interested in ufology, and he had heard he's he's on the East Coast. Um, you were saying there's a lot of it on the West Coast, so this is the East Coast <laughs> part of the LL Research Group. And um, he had heard about a group that was channeling in somewhere in Michigan, let's say, and and um, I forget what what uh, where he is, North Carolina or one, an East Coast state. And um, so he was very interested in that, and so he he gathered a group of I believe his students. Um, and as well as his, I think at the time, wife, Carla, and they started um, uh, trying to channel with um, the uh, procedures that this group said they should do it. And they said that they had, uh, they were doing, their tongues were just doing these funny clicks and they're all laughing at each other and they, they, they just couldn't do it after a few weeks. And so Don contacted this guy from the Michigan group, or, or let's just, again, let's say it's Michigan. And the guy drove over and, and when they all got together, he said, all right, let's see what you guys are doing wrong. So he laid down and he started channeling. And what he channeled was um, a, a being who said, they're all doing great and trying, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> he said, they're all doing really well and trying to get this done, but they're not letting us take over. They're, 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 they're too shy, they're whatever it was. And so um, after this guy came in and, and had this being tell them what, what the problem was, they were able to channel. So then Don's group started channeling for, uh, I think it started in the 60s. And um, the, the Law of One stuff came up in 1981. But um, in The Secrets of the UFO, he describes uh, this story, if, if I remember correctly. Um, and if it wasn't, it was in the beginning of the law of one stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, that's one reason why I do like the law of one stuff, because Don was a scientist and he and he came about it in, in the secrets of the UFO. He writes about how he tried to do this scientifically. And mm -hmm. um, and again, um, going back to what you were saying is, is a lot of their, uh, I think their original, the beings that they were channeling were saying, if you want to figure the figure this all out, meditate, 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 meditate. But what I like about what um, uh, Marshall's saying is it's more direct. It's like, if you meditate, we all have this. And I, and I believe that they did say this in the LL research um, papers because they still have all their papers. Everything's free. You don't have to pay for anything. Um, and if you don't believe it, they say that's fine. It's, it's, some people have called it cult-like, but it's, I don't, I, I can't, I have to disagree with that. But nonetheless, um, getting back to what you were saying is meditation seems to be one of the big keys for us to get ourselves out of um, the problems that, that we're seeing with these um, beings. Yeah. So, so yeah, Marshall's Marshall solution. So how, how do we get rid of these uh, unwanted visitors? How do we get sovereignty back for our planet? So it all boils down to awareness. The more people that are aware, the greater collective thought form will be created, which will then affect their ability in the mental environment. So it's all, to, it's all to do with the mental environment, the powers of persuasion. If you've got several billion people that are aware of these beings and their activities, you're going to have a strong collective thought form which will overcome their ability in the mental environment because the constant theme with a lot of these writings is the power of the collective mind. Mm -hmm. One mind can be strong, but a collective mind can be really strong. And that's mm -hmm. what these aliens have learned to do. With abductions, you often get several in a room. You don't just get one. The power of the collective mind. Um, so like I say, it's all to do with awareness. People, the government needs to disclose what the aliens are doing. Absolutely. They need to expose what these beings are doing, like what I'm doing on my website. And once a collective, once a critical mass of humanity are aware of that, what they're doing, these beings will have to go. Their, their powers of persuasion will no longer work. It's only working at the moment because everything's being done in secret. 
and their their activities aren't being disclosed disclosed on a, a worldwide level. Yeah, and it's it definitely seems the running theme is that we're not ready yet, and I guess the way to get ready is is part of this is becoming aware and also the meditation becoming stronger in meditation yeah but the thing is the, the longer the government leaves it the more the infiltration program is going to carry on you see so you really have to nip it in the bud as soon as possible you know when, when will humans ever be ready you know in 50 years time that their, their infiltration hybrid program may be complete and it could be too late so i think time time could be an issue here with uh, what they're doing well, yeah, and, and I'm sure a lot of people would say, well, this has been going on for, for mm -hmm. 70 years, so why, well, I mean, why shouldn't they be in the government already and we just don't know it? <laughs> I mean, what Marshall says, a lot of these societies, civilizations, they, they strip all the resources on their planet because they're so obsessed with technology, mm -hmm. then they either have to trade elsewhere or they become nefarious and become cos cosmic scavengers like the ones here are doing. They see mm -hmm. our planet as a resource. They want our resources. So they'll do anything via persuasion to try and get it. And that's how they have these tactics that I outlined earlier. Yeah. yeah. It's, all to do, it's all to do with resources, effectively. They're living in a physical environment like we do. They can mm -hmm. get they get through a lot more resources than we do. They've run out on their own in their own world. So mm -hmm. they're having to look elsewhere. Yeah. You see what us in the Oh, sorry, what prevents them from just taking it by force if they want to? Well, apparently, yeah. according to Marshall, there's like a galactic rule where you, you just can't go in with guns and lasers and take over a planet. It, that, that, that's when other beings would be involved. But apparently, if you can do it through persuasion, there's like a loophole which allows beings to do that. The other one, the other good civilizations, right, will stay off, off then. But um, yeah, that's basically what they say. Yeah, and everybody's, and, and even the the benevolent ones are able to do the same thing. They can still go in and try to send messages to people through meditation. Yeah. Or dream if, if, other, if other positive civilizations start getting involved, then it's going to dilute our own culture and some people worship them as gods, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. the good guys stand off. They'll, they'll tell you what's going on through a channel and then it's up for us then to get the information out. And once you've got that a critical mass of awareness, it will thwart these um, beings' abilities in the mental environment. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the message. Just, just disclose now. Tell everyone what the beings are doing. A lot of people aren't going to like it, but that's just the way it is. And I think the best way to look at aliens is, is they're part of nature. Some plants are poisonous, some aren't. Mm -hmm. Some animals are dangerous, some aren't. And it's the same with aliens. It's just a part of nature that's mm -hmm. been covered up from us. But, you know, the time is uh, overdue for us to be aware of that part of nature. And just to let you know, they don't like being called aliens. They like being called ETs. <laughs> Remember that next time I see one. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Sorry, I heard you don't like being called an alien. Yeah, it's funny. One of our experiencers, she said that that uh, the one that abducts her said said that to her that that mm -hmm. because of the connotations uh, that we've put on the, on that word. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of people claiming to be in contact with aliens face to face or channeling. For me. Right. I've got several rules of thumb. They have to be addressing the phenomenon we've talked about tonight. If they aren't, why aren't they doing that? Mm -hmm. um, I like plain English. There's enough confusion in the subject as there is. Let's keep it in plain English. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, they need to be talking about self-empowerment, not us acquiescing and some other external force coming in and helping us out. They have to be talking about self-empowerment. Uh, we're sentient beings. We've got this untapped potential within us, and we need to release that. That was perfect. And I'd say that that's probably perfect to end on because we are now at almost one hour and 30 minutes. So um, I, I will I, I will end on that. That was that was perfect. Let me uh, bring this back to to just us here and say um, thank you very much, Matt Hurley, for coming on. I think this was a really yeah. important uh, interview for us and humanity. And um, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. a lot of it was negative, but I hope I, I've turned it around at the end with a bit of a positive about our own potential. Well, that's that's what I want to emphasize is that um, this is all gruesome stuff that we're seeing with cattle mutilation, human mutilation, other animals being mutilated, UFO attacks. And yeah, it's all really negative. And usually people say, well, what can we do? And what we did was just told them what they can do. And um, it's, it's, it's an important message to send. And it's, an, it's important for us to wait raise this awareness so that we can start doing this. And 
Um, I think you are doing a great job and I will be sending people to your website. And um, where can people find you? Um, so my website is badaliens.info. In addition, if people are interested in the Allies of Humanity, they can visit alliesofhumanity.org. If they're interested in the writings of Marshall, V and Summers, they can visit newmessage.org. And I also have a video channel um, called Hurley Bird Productions. So they Google that, I'll come up. I've done about 40 videos, I think, on that, Excellent. covering various topics. Okay, well, not only uh, have you just said it, but we'll also have it down there in the description. So I'd also ask everybody to uh, like and subscribe to our channel as well. And that'll help us keep doing these uh, great interviews with our interesting and, and excellent guests. I'd um, like to add a little bit. Oh, yes, add please, add please do. Uh, it, it it strikes me that we're not just talking about animal mutilations and human mutilations. We're talking about mental mutilation. Mm -hmm. We are all getting subjected to to mental mutilation from so many angles. It's it's tough to wade through all that and still keep a clear uh, a mind and foresight to see what's important and what's not. It's really important to keep an open mind on, on things, even if they're disturbing, mm -hmm. which this is so that we have a more comprehensive idea of what's what we're dealing with at this stage. Yeah, a wise man once said that if you want something from the phenomenon, you will tend to filter out all the bad stuff. If you want it to be good, you will tend to ignore all the bad stuff. What I'm trying to do is just be honest and sincere because I want to know like everyone else what's going on. And I, I've just made those sections and hopefully that points the direction the way this phenomenon is going. Thank you both for being here and uh, we will see everyone on the next interview. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.